This took place when I was in my early 20s. It was the year 2003, and I was a taxi driver at the time. That was a job I did for several years while I was finishing my education. I worked the late shift mostly, since it was the only way I could fit with my schedule. After dropping off my last passenger, I started to head home. There was a new housing development on my route. I had passed through it a few times before. You could tell by the size of the unfinished houses that some serious money went into this place. During the day, the place was hopping with construction workers and landscapers, but it was nearly 2 a.m., and all that remained were piles of lumber and lifeless machinery. Excavators, bulldozers, and the like. The neighborhood backed onto a forest, another sign that it was an upper-class development. I had an eerie feeling as I slowly made my way through the construction site. There was a sign saying, slow for workers. I didn't know if it applied in the middle of the night, but I couldn't risk a ticket, so I followed it anyway. As I passed a large dump truck, my headlights illuminated the shape of a man. I didn't have time to react before he ran up to my window. Terrified, I quickly locked my doors and made sure all of my windows were up. As he neared the driver's side window, I could tell he was a clean-cut guy, probably in his mid-forties. He wore a flannel shirt with blue jeans and tennis shoes. He looked just like a normal guy. Normal apart from the fact that he was absolutely terrified. Tears rolling down his face, his whole body was shaking. He stood next to my car. His muffled words were unintelligible through my closed windows. Perhaps I should have driven away, but for some reason I decided to hear him out. I opened my window just enough so I could hear him. Please, sir. Please. Let me in. I have money, he pleaded. Um, is there someone I can call for you? I offered. There's no time. He's coming, the man begged. What's coming? I asked confusedly. Sir, please, there's no time to explain, he cried. I was more than a little scared at this point. Part of me wanted to help him, but we were so alone out there and his eagerness to get into the car had me worried. Most taxi drivers have a story to tell about a passenger who they shouldn't have picked up. It's an unfortunate part of the job, but assaults do happen. I reluctantly decided not to let him in. Hold on, I'll call the police for you, I told him. No, there's no time. Please. As I drove away, I could hear him shouting please while he ran after my car. My heart was divided as I listened to him cry. I drove straight to the police station and told them what happened. They told me to go home and that they would send someone to look for him. I did what they said. After a sleepless night, I called the police station to check if he was found. They told me that they sent two patrol cars to the spot where I saw him, but nothing was found. I was somewhat relieved, hoping that either he found another ride, or perhaps my suspicions were right and he had bad intentions. A few days later, I was watching the news. There was a report of a body found in the forest near the spot where I met the man. They showed a picture of the victim, and it was him, the man who had begged for my help that night. The reporter said the cause of death was an animal attack, but I don't believe it. There were no animals in that forest larger than a raccoon. Also, I distinctly remember the man saying, he's chasing me. If it were an animal, he would have said that. It was difficult for me to deal with the guilt I felt for turning my back on a person in need. I do believe that a lot of people would be sympathetic to the decision I made that night, but it's still hard. So many questions remain unanswered though. Who was he running from? Why was he being chased? and most terrifying of all, whatever it was, is it still out there? This is a true story of mine that took place back in September 2020. I was on a trip to Germany where most of my family and friends live aside from those who are in the state of California. Not to flex, but my family is extremely rich. I mean, way richer than I'm able to portray. In fact, my uncle is a billionaire as of this date. Therefore, I had my own personal supercar, which was a 2020 Lamborghini Aventator SV in Germany. 
I have my own back in the US too. My cousins, who also had a ghastly amount of money, were in Germany at that time as well. We decided to take a stroll on the German Autobahn with our supercars. For those of you who don't know, the Autobahn is a highway in Germany with no speed limit. The cruise consisted of me and my cousins David, Luke, and Werner. David had a Ferrari SF90, Luke was going to take his Porsche 918, and Werner was in his McLaren 720S. We began our ride at 8 p.m. Before we knew it, we were going just north of 260 kilometers per hour. I was having fun when I noticed something was wrong with David, and he was missing from the team. I looked around to make sure I wasn't mistaken, but to my horror, I wasn't. David was actually missing. I called my other cousins and told them to pull over. When I told them what happened, they were just as perplexed and horrified as I was because there's no way David could have gone missing abruptly at 250 kilometers per hour. I tried calling him, but he wasn't picking up. We did something next that we could probably get a ticket for. We turned our cars around and went the opposite direction on the road in order to look for David. When we got to the part of the road where David had last been seen, we decided to park our cars and go look for him in the woods next to the long autobahn. Not even three minutes later, I could hear cries for help. It was David's voice. We ran in the direction where the voice was coming from, only to realize something that to this day makes my skin turn cold. Every time we ran, the cries for help would be the same distance away, like David, or whatever was pretending to be David, was moving away from us while crying for help. We started panicking and crying in frustration. We looked and looked, but couldn't find him. With tears in our eyes, we called Luke's parents, who were just as terror-stricken as we were. They called the police for us, and we waited until they arrived. A huge search party was organized. It went on for three days until David's Ferrari was found. What was peculiar, though, was the fact that the car showed no sign of being part of an incident, meaning it was completely fine, not a scratch on it to be found, and nothing was missing from inside except David. The search party continued, but to no avail, for a solid year. This caused the case to be shut down, because no one could make out how this could happen, except if it were a glitch in the Matrix or something. It's 2022, and I still miss and cry for my dear cousin. His car has been returned to us, and I drive it around sometimes. I still hope for some reason that he's okay, or at least alive, and can be found. This incident has chilled every bone in my body. As unbelievable as it sounds, it is true, yet extremely puzzling. A few years ago, I was driving home from a friend's place. I lived out in the country, so I would often drive to town to hang out with friends. I don't remember exactly what we were doing this evening, but we would often go bowling, see a movie, or just grab an ice cream and hang out in the park. I do remember, however, that we'd lost track of time, and it was after midnight by the time I started to drive home. My house was about five miles from the highway. That's five miles of unlit, dirt roads, so at night it can be a little spooky. It is amazing how dark it actually gets, so dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face if the lights go out. Because of that, I always take this drive slowly in the dark because you can only see about 15 or 20 feet ahead. Therefore, if you need to stop for a deer or avoid a pothole, it helps to have that extra time. Not a lot of people live out there. That's why I was surprised to see a man walking along the side of the road. I was about half a mile from the highway at that point. My headlights illuminated his body as he stood there waving at me with a friendly smile on his face. He was a larger man, tall and burly with a mustache and old baseball hat. If I had to guess, I'd say he was in his late 30s. I know that alarm bells should have been going off in my head, but he really didn't seem threatening. Also, living in the country, people tend to help each other out, so maybe that's why I was so trusting. I slowed my car and he approached the driver's side window as I came to a stop. Howdy ma'am, I'm so sorry to bother you but could I trouble you for a ride into town?" he said. I didn't even hesitate and agreed. Sure, hop in, I said. 
Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. I'm Ricky, he said graciously. Well, you're welcome, Ricky. I'm Sheila, I replied. Naive as it sounds, he was just so polite that I couldn't help but trust him. I turned the car around and headed back to the highway. Like I said, we were only half a mile in at this point, so it was not a huge problem to give him a ride. We made small talk for several minutes. His calm demeanor made me feel at ease, even though I was alone in a car with a stranger. After not more than ten minutes, however, he said, I'm terribly sorry to have to do this, ma'am, but I'm going to need to take your car. I had to pause to take in what I was hearing. What are you talking about? I pleaded. Like I said, I need to take the car. Let's not make this difficult, he said. I sat there, stunned in disbelief. I was about to give him a piece of my mind when he pulled out a handgun and pointed it right at me. My heart nearly stopped when I looked at him. A look of sorrow was on his face, like he genuinely felt bad for what he was doing. I brought the car to a stop and got out. Ricky took the driver's seat and looked at me. One more thing, ma'am. I'm gonna need your phone. I can't have you calling the police on me, he explained. I didn't say a word, just handed him my phone, my whole body shaking. For what it's worth, I am sorry, he said before driving away into the night. I walked for about half an hour before I managed to flag down a police car. I told him what happened as we drove to the police station to file a report. The officer told me that my description matched that of a man who was wanted for several armed robberies in this and other surrounding towns. It was like he was waiting for somebody to pass by on the road so he could take advantage of their goodwill. I was that unlucky person. It really messed with my mind to have such a polite and friendly person turn on me in the blink of an eye. I've always been someone who tries to help others, but this has made me question my entire worldview. Why should I put myself at risk for someone who may mean to do me harm? That's a decision we all need to make for ourselves. I don't want to give up on the world or anything. It's just something to think about. Stay safe out there, and watch out for each other. I got off work one night at around 11pm. I worked at a fast food restaurant on the other side of town from where I lived. It was around a 45 minute drive, which was a long way to go for minimum wage, but I couldn't find anything else, so that's what I did. It began raining at around 10pm, so when I got off work at 11, the roads were really wet and slippery. I took it slow for the first half of my drive. Visibility was not great due to the rain and I was making my way through a somewhat rural part of town. I was on a paved road, but most of the turns led into the country, where the roads were unpaved. After a while, I noticed that there were not many cars on the road, so I started driving a little faster. I know it's not smart, but I was tired and eager to get home, so I could go to bed. Suddenly, I noticed a pair of red brake lights ahead of me. I was fast approaching, and I slammed on the brakes but it was too late. I crashed into a car, hitting the back fender as it was trying to make a turn onto one of the country roads. I immediately knew that I had messed up. The car may have slowed abruptly, but it's pretty well known that if you hit someone from behind, then there's no doubt who was at fault. I wasn't hurt or anything because I'd managed to reduce my speed enough before the impact. What was really going through my mind though was how much money this was going to cost me because I was not making very much at the time. I pulled my car over to the side of the road and shut off my engine. Then I wiped a tear from my cheek before stepping out of my car. I checked the damage on my car first. There was a broken headlight and a large dent. I was sure it would cost a few hundred to fix at least, but it could have been worse. My attention then turned to the other car, which had pulled over in front of me. The other driver still hadn't come out, so I waited between the two cars, rain was still falling. I was expecting to get yelled at, and I felt that I deserved it. After another 30 seconds, the front door of the other car opened and a man stepped out. He was a normal looking guy, probably 40 years old, with a grey hooded sweatshirt and blue jeans. I also noticed a handgun on his hip when he was bending over. 
Not a huge deal where I live, because many people carried firearms, but it did add to the tension of the situation. I had no idea how he would react. He walked to the back of his car to look at the damage. It was around the same amount of damage as on my car, a broken tail light and a large dent. Then he looked up and walked over to me. I could see a small trail of blood dripping down his face, definitely caused by the accident. That's when I knew that I really messed up. Looks like just a scratch. Don't worry about it, buddy, he said to me. Uh, are you sure? Did you notice that you're bleeding? I replied. Yeah, uh, that's from something else. Just take off, he told me. I was young, but I knew that if someone was injured in an accident, then you have to report it to the police. Any amount of trouble that I was in would be much worse if I didn't report it. So I said to the guy, I'm going to call this in. It was my fault. I don't remember exactly what he said then, but he tried to convince me not to report the accident. I was persistent though, and I took my phone out to dial 911. Then his mood changed. He looked angry, and he started walking towards me. He wasn't doing anything overtly threatening, but he was really invading my personal space. It was like a show of dominance. Add in the fact that he was armed, and I was seriously intimidated. I quickly agreed not to call, then I put my phone back into my pocket. The guy backed down immediately after that, then he turned around and got back into his car. I stood there for a minute, still shaken up by what had happened. However, just as the man was driving away, I had enough sense to memorize his license plate. I won't say what it was, but I repeated it in my head several times before it disappeared off into the distance. Then I went back into my car and called the police. I told them what had happened, that I was in a car accident where the other driver was injured, but he adamantly refused to get the police involved. They seemed to take the situation very seriously, and when I gave them the license plate number, they ran it through their system. It turned out that the car was stolen several days before. Not only that, but it had been used in an armed robbery since then. I finally understood why the man didn't want to call the police. They asked me to come by the station and give a description of the man. It was after midnight by the time I got there, and I was dead tired, but I knew how important it was to get that guy off the streets, so I went. I did my best to help with the investigation in any way that I could. I heard that he eventually was caught and charged with several crimes. The damage to my car was about $250 which I paid out of pocket, and I was never charged for the damage to the other car, although I suppose the rightful owner could probably come after me for it. Either way, money is not what's important. That guy was really dangerous, and if I had been more persistent about calling the police while he was there, I have no doubt that he would have done something to me. Something really scary happened to me when I was around 18 years old back in the early 90s. I was really into cars back then, and I liked working on my cars, even though I was a girl. I had a 1979 Z28 Camaro with T-tops, and in the summer, I would go cruising around with my friends, looking for something to do. One evening, while driving up and down the main street in a neighboring city, I noticed a small red truck following us at a distance. I was with my friend Jenny, and I mentioned to her that I thought the truck could be following us. I pulled into a driveway for a fast food restaurant, and noticed the truck pulled into the restaurant three car lengths back. I drove out to the other direction, and he did the same. Again, I pulled into another driveway, and the truck pulled in as well. I did this several times, and the truck kept following, always staying three car lengths back. Jenny and I decided that we should start to head towards home, which was about 30 minutes away. We thought the driver of the truck would just give up and let us go, but he didn't. He just kept following. It was getting very late, and we were beginning to worry, because the truck had been following us for almost an hour. We didn't want to go home and let him follow us there. I decided that the best thing to do would be to drive to the nearest police station. I told Jenny what I was planning on doing, and to my horror, she grabbed the steering wheel and pulled it causing the car to veer sharply right. What are you doing? I screamed at her. You're going to make us crash. 
It was bad enough that I had to worry about that truck following us, but now I had to worry about my passenger freaking out and causing an accident. No, we can't go to the police, she insisted. It then occurred to me that she somehow thought that we were at fault. That somehow just by cruising around, she thought we had done something to provoke this. I reluctantly drove away from the police station. We approached a bridge and stopped for a red light on the one-way street. The truck was directly behind the car next to us. The car turned right, allowing the truck to pull forward. I looked over, and I was shocked to see that the guy had stepped out of his truck, and he was standing next to the passenger side door of my car, with no pants on. This guy didn't have pants down on his ankles, as a matter of fact, he didn't have any at all. I had the disturbing feeling that he probably didn't have any with him this whole time that he had been following us. I hit the gas pedal and ran the red light going over the bridge. Somehow my friend didn't see him out of her window. When I told her, she just kept saying, no way. I drove up and down for a few more streets and back over the bridge, then out into the country. He followed us for what seemed like forever until we were able to finally lose him, going really fast out in the middle of nowhere. We went home and tried to forget about it. For some reason, I never told my parents, and I'm not sure why. A few weeks later, I saw on the news that the police were searching for a guy in a small red truck. They showed his picture, and it resembled the guy that I saw following us. I thought their description of the truck was a little different from the one we had seen, but maybe not. I always wondered if it was him, and I think it was. I was 16 at the time of this event. My close friend Shayla and I were driving home from a visit with my distant family in West Michigan. Back then, I lived in Portsmouth, Virginia. It was 11 p.m., and we were the only ones on the road. I had never taken this way before, but I wanted to skip the toll roads this time, so we decided to try it out. Shayla and I were so busy in conversation that we didn't notice that what was coming up was an abandoned town. As I finally became aware of our surroundings, I had a horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. My friend caught on, and she asked me if I was alright. Yeah, I'm okay. This town is pretty creepy though, I replied. I wasn't lying. There were old houses with boarded up windows and closed down shops. Even cars and trucks that were left abandoned. It honestly looked like a scene from a horror movie. My friend and I stayed silent. You could feel the drastic change in the air. It felt sinister. A couple minutes of silence passed, and my car started to shake. I realized that we were running low on gas. I totally forgot to stop miles back in a different town. I pulled over in front of yet another abandoned house. What a great place to break down, Shayla laughed nervously. I nodded in agreement at her sarcastic comment. I took my phone out and called roadside assistance which my parents had programmed into my phone. That's when I noticed that we didn't have any cell reception, so I got out of the car, and Shayla followed. That's where things started to get really weird and scary. I was completely focused on getting reception. I suddenly realized that Shayla was staring straight ahead, and she looked terrified. She whispered in my name, and pulled on my shirt, then she pointed ahead. There's a man standing about ten feet away from us. Shayla whispered to me. I followed her gaze and she was right. There was a man about six foot two standing there in front of my car's headlights. How can anyone be here? This place is a dead town. I didn't breathe or speak. My heart was in my stomach. Finally, Shayla spoke up. Do you need something? She called out. Right then, he tilted his head and smiled widely which scared us even more. At that point, I was so terrified that I couldn't even move. He just stared at us, smiling. My dad's a cop, you freak, Shayla yelled. That was a big mistake on her part, because his expression turned to anger, and he started moving towards us very fast. Our adrenaline kicked in, and we ran into the car and locked the doors. We looked up at the man, but he was gone. 
We sat there confused for a minute, until we noticed a noise coming from below the car. I was breathing so heavily that I was distracted from the sound. He was underneath my car. Shayla was screaming, tears flowing down her cheeks, and I was trying to stay calm, just hoping that my phone would get service. Finally, I got two bars. I called the cops and told them what was happening. They responded that they'd be there in 20 minutes. 20 minutes seemed like an eternity given the circumstances, but we were in the middle of nowhere, so it is what it is. When the phone call ended, the sound stopped. I was still on high alert, scared out of my mind. I hugged Shayla, and we both cried. Her face went emotionless when she looked behind me towards the back window. My heart told me not to look, but I couldn't help it. That man and four others, two other men and two women, were standing behind our car. My heart dropped yet again. They all smiled at us in a very creepy way. Just then, I started to hear police sirens, and I sighed with relief. Shayla and I looked in front of the car, and we saw a police car pulling up. I've never been so happy to see a police officer. By the time he walked up to my car, the people had disappeared. I was so shaken up that I couldn't even explain to the cops what had happened. Shayla did that for me. They offered to get gas for me, but instead, I begged them to bring us to a hotel in a very populated area and call my parents so they could come and get us. To this day, the police never found those people, and we never figured out where they could possibly have come from. My guess is that they lived in one of the abandoned buildings. I hope they block this town off someday, and I never took the back way again. This happened just a few days ago, when I was on a road trip with my cousin James. I was 13, and James was 21. James and I were on a road trip from our grandmother's to our aunt's house. I have a great relationship with my cousin, so my parents let me go on trips with him occasionally. It was about a 10 hour drive, and we were 3 hours into it. It was 9pm at the time, and I was pretty tired, and everything was hilarious at the moment. So when I saw a red semi-truck outside my window, I just started laughing. The man in the truck was heavy set to say the least, and he had a long untamed beard. He had a creepy vibe, but I waved to him anyway. He in turn did some kind of groping motion to me. I found it more hilarious than creepy, and I started laughing harder and told James the story, doing the whole groping motion and all. He looked creeped out and disgusted, but there wasn't anything either of us could do. A while later, about four and a half hours into the drive, James pulled into a rest stop. I walked into the bathroom, and when I came out, the man was just standing there. He looked to be at least six feet tall. I looked out the glass door leading into the building, and saw James glaring daggers through the door. I was confused and walked back to the car. What he told me, really creeped me out. So much so that I started crying. Then again, I had been awake for around 20 hours. The man stared at me and followed me into the building mumbling. James said he was basically talking normally. He attempted to comfort me, but quickly said that he had to go to the bathroom and went inside. A few seconds later, when I was in the car, the guy was at my window. He stared at me again with a wide creepy grin. He started saying that I should go with him, and that he was going to treat me really well. He offered me candy, and just tried to coax me into his truck. I was busy bawling my eyes out. Then right on cue, James walked out, and yelled at the guy, and threatened him. The guy backed off and got back into his truck. He stared at me with that grin on his face. We floored it out of there. We wanted nothing to do with this guy. It was around 12 a.m. when we pulled into the motel to sleep. The rest of the night till 8 a.m. was fine. The next morning, we were at a restaurant eating breakfast, and that same guy sat across from us. He grinned at me. I looked over at James, and he was ready to explode with anger. The guy walked by our table, on his way to the bathroom, and he brushed his hand on my shoulder, then did the same on his way back. It was definitely not an accident. 
Both James and I knew it. James was a chill dude, and he'd let almost anything slide. But because he's known me since I was a baby, he's very protective over me. He's not like that with any of my other siblings. He and I are close. He was obviously angry before, but at this point, he stood up from his seat and walked over to the guy's table. He started yelling at the guy to stop following us and back off. He made no threats, but he did curse a lot. I felt pretty nervous and I just wanted to go. The guy stood up and smacked James, then yelled about how I was leading him on. Remember, I was 12 years old at the time. Their argument continued, and the cops came and separated them. They got the story and came to the conclusion that because he was assaulted, we could press charges. James decided not to, and we just continued the day. The rest of the trip was pretty bland. The guy wasn't seen for the rest of it. However, James did follow me like a bodyguard when we went anywhere. Even though he was protecting me, I was still terrified. I'm a 13-year-old female, and it was a few months ago when this happened. I was on a hockey trip with the rest of my family. I don't play, but my siblings do. I'm generally a quiet person. I have social anxiety, and I don't react well to situations with people complimenting me or anything like that. My family had just pulled into a rest stop, which I was already familiar with. I was walking in to get a drink with my little sister, who was nine. Suddenly, she ran ahead of me. I didn't care much at first, but I soon wished that she'd stayed by my side, because not even a few seconds later, a Caucasian man who looked to be in his mid-forties honked his horn at me. I instantly jumped back, because I was right next to his car, which was a red four-door sedan. He started telling me how pretty I was, and how I should hop into his car. Being the unsocial person that I am, I walked away with no reply. I ran inside to go meet up with my little sister. I'm pretty close with her, so I told her what happened, and we just laughed about it. We didn't think much of it, and soon left. The man made crude gestures to me as I walked back to my other siblings. I have two sisters and one brother. My brother's pretty intimidating, and he's 16. My other sister's 15, and not intimidating. They both play hockey, and they're both stronger than me. We drove off and made our way to the hotel where we were staying. It was an hour or two away, so after a while, we stopped at another rest stop so me and my siblings could stretch. I had already forgotten about the encounter with the man when I noticed a car pull in. It was a red four-door sedan. I didn't pay much attention to it at first until I walked into the restroom area. A man followed me in and just sat on the bench like he was waiting for someone. I wanted to avoid eye contact, so I pulled my little sister next to me and we just spoke about video games for a while. Eventually my mom walked in and told me to go back to the car. I always avoid talking to strangers, and I get really nervous if someone even says hi to me, so I avoid eye contact with people that I don't know. As I was walking back out, the man followed me. He was around the same height as me, I'm five foot eight. He walked next to me and whispered something into my ear along the lines of, You would look good tied to my bed. I don't completely remember what he said exactly, but it was something like that. I just tensed up and ran for my car, jumping into the back seat. I was scared, but because I was an idiot, I only texted my friend about it. She told me it was some random creep, and not to worry. I did as she said, and forgot about it. I thought that was it for the encounters, but I was wrong. Once my family got to our hotel, we checked in and went to the ice rink. It took longer than we thought to get to the hotel, so we had to leave for the rink immediately. I began to forget the man again. It was the start of the second period of the game, and I was sitting outside the actual rink with my sister. I didn't bother watching, at least not at first. My sister and I were playing some multiplayer games when a man sat right next to me and asked me what I was playing. I got extremely uncomfortable and moved away, only to have him move closer. He began asking me if I had a boyfriend, and I just pointed to my ear to pretend I was deaf. It was pretty stupid looking back, but I had a plan if he believed me. I don't know that much sign language, but I know enough to get by. 
Sadly, he didn't buy it and continued to ask. I stayed silent, ignoring him until he put his cold hand on my thigh. I was wearing leggings, so I felt how cold his hand was. I jumped, and when I did, he squeezed me. In the game that my sister and I were playing, you could message each other things, so I quickly looked at her and wrote in the chat of our game, ask me to go to the bathroom with you. She looked at me and realized what was going on. She leaned in and asked me to go to the bathroom. We hid in there for a while until the game was over. I didn't see him until the next game, which was the next day. My sister had a fever that day, so I volunteered to stay with her at the hotel. I really did it to avoid the man. It was a few minutes later, and I heard a knock at the door. At that time, my little sister was downstairs getting breakfast from the hotel. I assumed it was her, and I opened the door. I hated what I saw instead of my sister. It was the same man as before. I was horrified. His face had a horrible grin on it. Before he could say anything, I slammed the door and decided it was a good time to call the police. I was crying at that point as I sat against the door and called 911. They arrived shortly after and the man was arrested. It turned out he had been taking pictures of me the whole trip. He had been following me this whole time, even when I was swimming with my siblings. From then on, I don't ever walk alone. I hate it. I just really hope I never see him again. It was the second scariest thing in my life. I'm 14 years old and I'm very small. Since I'm barely five feet tall and 100 pounds, I look younger than I really am. This happened a month ago when I was moving. After the moving truck was loaded, I fell asleep in it. An hour or two later, I was in a town near my new home. My grandmother was parked in a Burger King parking lot and I was still asleep. So my 19 year old cousin, let's call her Max, came to the passenger door and woke me up to help carry the food. I agreed. We went into the Burger King and she ordered. Then I tapped her arm and told her I was going to the restroom. When I was done, I exited the restroom and I noticed an older man, about mid-50s, maybe early 60s, staring at Max and then at me. I paid no mind to it since I was still very groggy. I walked over to Max as she tried to get some soda from one of the machines. Finally, after a while, she got the soda and we left the Burger King. As I was sitting in the moving truck sipping on my chocolate milkshake, I saw the guy walking towards the truck and he said, I know who you are and stopped at the driver's side, where my grandmother was. She looked rather confused and replied, Who am I? He said with the exact same tone, The woman of God. Then he started rambling about taking care of us girls. All the while, I was terrified. Ideas flashed through my mind of creepy things I'd read on Reddit. Then suddenly, he pointed to me with a dead serious expression and said, You're a pain in the ass. I was then really confused and also scared out of my mind, and I started laughing awkwardly and mumbled something. He continued rambling until I heard Max calling me, telling me that I left my fries in the bag, but I already had my fries. I went over to ask her what she meant as she changed the topic to the guy. About five minutes later, we agreed that he was giving off creepy vibes. My grandmother, however, called my name to say that we were leaving. The old man's car was blocking our path at the time, so he hopped in and moved out of our way. He did the I'm watching you motion with his fingers and mouthed the words, I'm watching you. Now this is when I grabbed my phone and called Max. I told her to make sure he didn't follow us. Luckily, he didn't. It just creeps me out to think that he was watching us get our food and our drinks that whole time. To understand the magnitude of this story, you must know who I am, so here's a little backstory. I was born in 1954, so my formidable years were spent growing up under the influence of the 60s and early 70s in a very small town in upstate Ohio. When I say small, I mean one light at Broadway in Maine. There were about 40 businesses in the center of town. 
The drugstore soda shop was right on one of those corners. There was also a hardware store, a small grocery store, Ben Franklin's, a gas station, and a barber shop. We had Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, and Catholic churches, and most everyone went to one of them weekly. We also had a library, a post office, and a jail. The jail was set up so you could easily sneak right past the cop at the desk nine times out of ten. You could go in and see if anyone was in the jail. If there was, we would run errands for them, go get cigarettes or whatever. We never bothered to ask why they were in there. I was a curious, free-spirited, and completely wild, innocent child. A little bit later came the assassination of JFK, the civil rights movement, the Vietnam protests, and the hippie revolution, which I joined, becoming one of the earliest hippies. Hitchhiking was commonplace in those years, so I did a lot of it. For a little over three years, I made many trips all over the United States and Canada, much to the dismay of my mother. Sometimes I took friends, sometimes I went alone, always with no money, no clothes, and no worries. Many people tried to warn me of the dangers, but being very young and naive, and feeling quite invincible, I ignored all of their well-meaning advice. This wasn't my first trip, nor was it my last, but it was my most memorable, and you'll understand the gravity of the very close call it was. In June 1969, I was 14, and I was spending the night with my friend Dina, who lived in a neighboring town. I talked her into coming with me to San Francisco. She just happened to have a brother living out there, and she had not seen him in a while. So we headed out across the cow pasture to the highway and stuck out our thumbs. It never took long to get a ride, as you can probably imagine. We received many rides. A band's tour bus picked us up on their way to a gig in Chicago. Uh, we didn't want to make that big of a detour, so we passed. I can't remember what the band was. I remember another ride when we got into a Cadillac with four black men and went to a party in the black part of Columbus, Ohio. We were the only white people at this party, and let me tell you, we had a blast. I never felt unwanted or in danger. In fact, the nice lady that lived in that apartment gave me a shirt, which I thought was so kind. Now as an adult, I realized she was trying to cover me up. God bless her. The next ride was pretty cool until we picked up another hitchhiker. He was a lone guy who kept nagging the driver about how much trouble he was going to get into if he got caught taking these two underage girls across state lines. I became very agitated and told him to shut up. We should have gotten out right there, but we stayed. He wasn't dangerous, just annoying. The driver stopped for gas in Iowa and Dina and I went to the restroom to freshen up. When we came back, the cops were out waiting for us, and then we ended up in the Iowa City Jail. I'm sure our parents were contacted immediately, although I don't recall that part. We were quite the attraction at the little jail. The cops would come up and talk to us and play cards. They would bring us cigarettes, candy, and donuts. I don't think we were there for too long before Dina's mom had driven to pick us up, and after a conversation with her daughter, she decided to drive us the rest of the way to California. That's just over 1,900 miles. Unbelievable. I remember singing to the radio all the way to Nevada. I especially remember the Mamas and Papas song, Are You Going to San Francisco? Later we booked into a hotel in Reno. It was really boring there. That's not what I signed up for. I tried to talk Dina into just taking off. I realize now as an adult what a terrible and selfish act that would have been, and how devastating it would have been to her mom. Lucky for everyone, she refused to do that, so I stayed. We finally ended up in San Francisco, right at Height and Ashbury, near Berkeley College, where all the hippie action was. We did have a mom tagging along though. It was all so overwhelming to me. I was pretty cool for our little town, but this stuff was way out of my league. Like I said before, I was very naive, and I was not fully aware of things like drug addiction. But I saw it firsthand at Needle Park. Seeing everyone strung out on drugs scared me to death. I saw other things too that I cannot mention. Needless to say, I was shocked. I wanted to go home, and I've never wanted to go back to California again, and I never have been back to this day. I don't remember how many weeks I was gone on that particular adventure, but shortly after, I was watching TV at home with my mom. It was July and it was all over the news about the Manson family 
in the infamous murders. I then realized how close I had come to being picked up by them and possibly becoming part of the family. What if I had taken off on my own that night and not stayed with Dina and her mom? Hitchhiking alone through the desert, nine hours away from Spawn Ranch. What if that guy had not turned us into the cops in Iowa, then we would have been out there just the two of us. Most likely I or both of us would have been picked up by one of them. Later I found out that the Manson family were actually recruiting people from Hyden to Ashbury, where we were. Every day I'm thankful that I did not get caught up in that. I was sure ripe for the picking back then, especially if they had gotten a hold of me before I made my way all the way to California. I remember the night so vividly, even though it was over 12 years ago. I was a teenager, and I was hanging out with some friends at my buddy's house. We were just playing video games and goofing around, as teenagers do. But as the night wore on, it became time for everyone to head home. It was my turn to drive. I had brought my mom's beautiful minivan for the occasion. My favorite part about that was that I got to look super cool while I was driving. I wore some rad shades, even though it was night. I was happy to help out, and it gave me a chance to hang out with my friends a little longer. The first three were dropped off without any incident, but then it was on to Alton's house. I knew Alton lived in a remote area, I had no idea how far out it was, because I'd never been there before. We drove down a long winding road that was nothing but gravel, and there was forest on either side. It was so dark that I could barely see the road ahead of us. I drove slowly, because I could only see as far as my headlights would shine. Even with the high beams on, that was not very far. After what felt like a long time, we arrived at Alton's house. It was a small, simple house, tucked away in the woods. He thanked me and hopped out of the minivan. Then I turned around and started the long drive back. I was nervous about the drive back, mainly because it was so dark and remote. I made sure to pay attention to all the turns on the way in so that I wouldn't get lost. I repeated them in my head several times, and I was pretty sure that I would remember. I was about halfway back to the main road when something caught my eye. There was a man on the side of the road, just standing there. At first I thought it was a hitchhiker. That alone would have been strange enough because there was very little traffic at that time of night, but as I got closer, he disappeared into the woods. I remember feeling really scared and confused. I wasn't sure what to make of it, but I knew it wasn't normal. I knew there were other houses in the area, but they were few and far between, so it didn't make sense to see somebody on foot, especially at night. I finally made it home, and tried to forget about the strange man in the woods. I told myself he must have just been some local out for a late night walk, implausible as it sounds. It wasn't until the next day that I found out something terrible had happened. I was hanging out with my friends again. I told them what I had seen in the woods that night. But then someone mentioned that one of Alton's neighbors had gone missing that night. I listened with fear as they continued to talk. I was sure it must have been connected to what I had seen. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Was it possible that the strange man I saw on the road was actually involved in the disappearance? The thought made my skin crawl. We called the police right then and there. I told them that I was in the area and I saw a strange man on the road in the middle of the night. The cops told me to come into the station. I went in and gave them a more detailed account of what I saw in the night leading up to it. I tried to get more information about the case because I was curious, but they told me it was confidential. Fair enough, I guess. As the days went on, I couldn't stop thinking about what happened. I kept replaying the events in my mind wondering if there was something I could have done differently. But in the end, there really wasn't anything I could do. What could I have done? Pulled my car over and chased the man through the woods in the dark? The police combed through the woods for days, paying special attention to the spot where I saw the man, but nothing was found, and Alton's neighbor never returned. After a few years, I had all but forgotten about the whole situation. The case must have gone cold, because I hadn't heard anything about it in a long time. That is until one day when I was watching the news. Alton's neighbor's body was finally discovered, but it wasn't in the area where I had seen the man. It was in a different section of woods over 50 miles away. 
I still can't help but think back at that night and wonder if it was really him I saw on the road. I wonder if he moved the body to a different place because he knew I had seen him. There's no way to be sure, but I believe that there was something happening on those roads that night. Something evil. This happened on a warm night in September of 2013. I noticed the full moon as I drove down a deserted road. My headlights cut through the thick fog that had settled over the city. I had just finished a long shift at the hospital, and I was looking forward to a quiet night in. But fate had other plans for me. As I rounded the bend in the road, I saw two cars pulled over on the side. They were illuminated by the glow of a street light. As I got closer, I saw that there was a man being held at gunpoint by another man. I slowed as I passed. The victim was trembling and pleading with the gunman, but he was relentless in his demand for money and valuables. They didn't even seem to notice me at first. Perhaps all the commotion was distraction enough for me to go unnoticed. My hands began to shake on the wheel as I realized I was witnessing a crime in progress. I knew I had to act quickly, so I backed my car to a dark section of the road and fumbled for my phone in my pocket. I dropped it on the floor of my car, my eyes still fixated on the robbery. I reached down for my phone, not wanting to look away. I finally found it and dialed 911. Then I watched in horror as the gunman turned towards me. Until then, I thought I was well hidden by the darkness, but I was wrong. I quickly hit the gas and sped away, praying that he wouldn't follow me. I drove for several minutes, my hands shaking on the steering wheel as I recounted what I had just seen. When I finally pulled over to the side of the road, my phone rang. It was the police. I wasn't sure how long they were on the line, but I imagined all they would have heard from me was heavy breathing and maybe some mild swearing. When I answered the phone, the officer told me that someone was on the way and he'd be there soon. I breathed a sigh of relief as I hung up the phone, knowing that I did the right thing by calling for help, but as I sat there in the car waiting for the police to arrive, I noticed a car pull up behind me. At first I thought it was the gunman, because the car looked similar to one of the ones I had seen before. Then I realized that it was just another driver, probably curious about what was going on. As the minutes ticked by, I began to feel uneasy. The driver of the other car had gotten out, and he was pacing back and forth behind his vehicle, as if he was waiting for something. I started to think I was wrong, and that maybe it was the gunman after all. My instincts told me something wasn't right, so I locked my doors and kept a close eye on him. Just when I was about to call the police again, I saw flashing lights in the distance. The cavalry had finally arrived and I felt relieved that the two squad cars pulled up behind me. The other guy didn't leave. I figured that if it was the gunman, then he would have probably split by now, so I felt a little more relaxed. But if it wasn't the gunman, then who was he? One of the officers approached my car. We spoke for a few minutes about what was happening. He told me to stay in my car, and walked away, and both officers approached the other driver, who had stopped pacing and was now standing silently by his car. I watched through my rearview mirror as both police officers approached him. Suddenly, the driver bolted and ran into the woods, disappearing into the darkness. The police officers chased after him, but he was too quick and too elusive. For several hours, the police searched the area for that driver, combing through the woods and checking nearby houses. But he had vanished without a trace, leaving behind only more questions. The next day, I received a call from the police, telling me that they had identified the driver and that he had a long criminal history. They thanked me for calling in the crime and for being observant, which had helped them catch a dangerous criminal. His behavior is still really confusing for me. What was he thinking following me to that spot? And why wouldn't he take off as soon as the police arrived? Maybe he was on something, or maybe he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. In the weeks that followed, I couldn't stop thinking about what had happened that night. I knew that I had done the right thing by calling the police, but I also knew I had put myself in danger by getting involved at all. Despite the risks, I would do it all over again. It was a no-brainer, really. What would you do if you saw someone being robbed in plain sight?
I'm a taxi driver, and I've been doing the job for over 10 years now. This happened almost four years ago. I've seen it all, from drunk and rowdy people to quiet and reserved. But nothing prepared me for the night when I picked up a passenger who would change my life forever. It was a cold night, the kind of night that makes you want to stay home and snuggle under the covers. But duty called, and I had work to do. I was driving my taxi around the city, looking for my next fare, when I saw him standing on the corner. He was a tall man, dressed in a dark suit, and he had his hands in his pockets. He pulled one of his hands out and signaled for me to stop the car. He opened the back door and got in, closing it behind him. I could see that he was a bit nervous, and he looked around the car like he was searching for something. I greeted him, and then he replied with a nod. Where to? I asked. He gave me the address. It was on the other side of town. I shifted the car into gear and drove off. I tried to make small talk to break the ice. He was polite but distant, answering my questions with only a few words. As we drove, he suddenly changed his mind and asked to be taken to a different address. I followed his instructions, and we drove through a dark and deserted street. He then asked me to stop in front of an old building. It looked abandoned, so I wasn't sure exactly what he could want to do there. I hesitated for a moment, but he assured me that it was safe. When we parked the car, he got out, and he told me to wait for him. I could see him approaching a man on the street. They exchanged a few words. The other man was scary looking, with a shaved head and a lot of tattoos. That was in stark contrast to my passenger, who looked like a done-up businessman. I was about to drive away, but just in time, my passenger returned to the car. He was followed by the scary-looking man. Both got into the back seat, then my passenger told me to drive, and I did what I was told. I felt uneasy about the situation, but I couldn't refuse. As we drove, the passenger and the scary-looking man spoke in low voices. I could only make out a few words, but I came to suspect that I was being used in a crime. My heart started racing. I knew I had to do something to protect myself. The smartest thing would probably be to go through with whatever they were planning, and then call the police afterwards. However, I knew there was a police station only a few blocks out of the way. It was a quick decision, but I decided to go for it. I took the turn and slammed on the gas pedal. As we approached the station, the passenger suddenly pulled out a gun and pointed it at me. Don't even think about it, he said. Keep driving. By then, it was too late. We were right in front of the police station. I brought the car to a stop, and the two men got out and ran away. I was in shock, and I could hear my heart thumping. After I caught my breath, I walked into the station and told the police what had just happened. I still didn't know what those guys were up to, but one of them pointed a gun at me. I described the men as best I could, but I later found out that they were even captured on the security camera of the police station. We were that close. The next day, the police called me and asked me to come to the station for an interview. They had caught the two men, and they wanted me to identify them. I went down to the station, and they showed me a lineup of suspects. I recognized the passenger immediately. I pointed him out to the police. They arrested him and charged him with attempted robbery and assault. The scary looking man was also arrested, and they found a weapon on him that linked him to the other crimes. I was relieved to know that they were off the streets, and they wouldn't be able to do any more harm. Over time, the memory of that night began to fade, and I returned to my routine. I've had some other scary experiences over the years, and maybe I'll share those someday but this is definitely the scariest. When I was 10 or 11 years old, my family took a trip down to Florida to visit my grandparents. They lived in a small town right on the Gulf of Mexico, where the weather was warm and the beaches were beautiful. I always looked forward to these trips because I lived in the north where the weather was not great all year round. We would always go in March when my brother and I had a week off from school. We always left early in the morning, well before the sun even thought about rising. My dad would be in charge of driving, 
but my mom would take over once in a while so that my dad could rest. The trip was long, and we would always do it in one big stretch, where my dad would drive all night. We always made sure to stop every once in a while to stretch our legs and grab a bite to eat. One of our stops was at McDonald's, which we thought would be a quick and easy meal. As we were standing in line, a man started yelling at my dad, accusing him of cutting. My dad tried to explain that he wasn't, but the man wouldn't listen. My mom tried to defuse the situation, but the man was too angry. I remember feeling scared and wanting to hide, but my dad stayed calm and didn't engage with the man's aggression. After we finished eating, we got back into the car and hit the road again. However, we soon realized that the man from the McDonald's was following us. We ignored him for a while, hoping he would turn off into a different direction, but he continued to follow us. I watched him from the back window, and it made me feel really scared. My mom asked my dad what we should do. He told her to ignore him, and that he would get bored eventually. All of a sudden, he rammed our car from behind. The impact caused our car to swerve. My brother started to cry. My parents quickly realized that we needed to call the police. My mom dialed 911 and calmly told the operator what was happening. Her voice was calming, even though I knew she was forcing it for mine and my brother's sake. After no more than a few minutes, we started to hear sirens and noticed a police car approaching from behind. We pulled over to the side of the road, and the other car kept driving. The police car pursued the other car while we sat and waited. Another police car came up behind us, and the officer approached our car. He told us that the man was arrested. We were told that he had been drinking, and that he was already on probation for previous violent behavior. After checking the damage to our car, my dad decided that we would simply continue with the trip. There was a large dent in the bumper where he rammed us, but the police said it was safe. The rest of our trip was filled with fun and laughter as we enjoyed the Florida sunshine and time with our grandparents. We went to the beach, ate delicious seafood, and explored the small town where my grandparents lived. As we drove back home, I thought about how lucky we were to have made it out of that situation. Accidents happen all the time on the highways, and we could have been run off the road by that guy. Luckily, that didn't happen. After my second year of college, I finally bought my first car. I could never afford one when I was in high school, but thanks to student loans, I was finally able to get my hands on a used Toyota Corolla. I was driving it back to my parents' house for the summer, a big step up from the bus ride that I was used to. It was about an eight hour drive, so I made sure to leave early in the morning. I had been driving for several hours, and the boredom started to get to me. I had noticed a few hitchhikers along the way, and I decided not to pick anybody up. I think it might actually be illegal where I live, but I'm not sure. Anyway, after another dull half hour, I noticed a hitchhiker at the side of the road. I slowed my car as I got close in order to take a look at him before making a decision. He was a younger guy, probably my age, with a scruffy beard and bandana. He wore a jean jacket and brown pants with running shoes. Just a normal looking guy, I thought. I stopped my car on the shoulder and he jogged over. How's it going? I said. Great, thanks man. I'm Pete, he said graciously. Then I unlocked the door, he got into the front seat, and I started driving. We were actually hitting it off really well. He was super funny, and we had a lot in common. The time seemed to fly by, and eventually, it had been over an hour. It was then that I realized that he never told me where he was going, so I asked him. He told me that his friend has a small hobby farm close to here, and he was going to visit. He said that he would get out on the highway and walk the rest of the way if I didn't want to take him all the way there. At this point, I felt like the two of us had become friends, so I had no problem going a little off course in order to save him hours of walking. I told him that I'd take him all the way to the farm, and that he would just have to let me know where to get off the highway. We continued driving for a while, and eventually, Pete told me to take the next exit. 
I followed his instructions, and he continued to direct me until we were on a pretty remote dirt road in the country. We were surrounded by cornfields, but it all seemed like a large-scale commercial farm, not the small hobby farm that I was expecting. Are we in the right place? I asked. Yeah, this is it, he said casually. What? Where is it? I prodded. We're here, just let me out, he insisted. I brought the car to a stop, and Pete quickly got out without saying a word. Not even thank you. Then he started walking down the road away from my car. This had me confused. We were in the middle of nowhere. This couldn't possibly be where he wanted to go, but what do I know? Although I was a little put off by his rudeness, I turned my car around and started driving back the way I came. The country road had been empty until now. I hadn't seen another car or person or anything. However, that was about to change. As I was making my way back to civilization, I saw a truck on the road. It was a black pickup truck, I'm not sure what make or model. It was stopped in the middle of the road, blocking my path. I was confused at first, but then I saw another truck approaching from behind. That was when I realized that I'd fallen into a trap. Pete must have been in on it. I had only a few seconds to decide what to do, because the space was closing in on me quickly. I looked left and saw nothing but cornfields. I looked right and also saw more cornfields, but off in the distance, the highway was just barely visible. I thought that I could probably make it there through the field, so I turned right and started plowing through. My vision was completely obstructed by large stalks of corn, but the highway was a large target. If I kept going straight, then I would get there eventually, I thought. After a few minutes in the field, I did eventually reach the highway. I turned onto it and got at least a few stares from the other drivers when they saw me emerge. That was a close call, but it could have ended a lot worse. What really gets me about this experience was how easy it was for Pete to gain my trust. Normally, I would not allow a stranger to lead me into the middle of nowhere alone but all it took was an hour of good conversation, and I was willing to lower my defenses. Live and learn, I guess. Stay safe out there, everyone. I drove my car across the country a few years ago. It was something that I'd wanted to do for a long time, so when I accepted a job on the West Coast, I decided to use that as an excuse to cross something off my bucket list. Of course it would have been faster and cheaper to fly, but I was really excited to see some of the often overlooked parts of America. However, something would happen to me on the trip that would make me regret that decision. I planned for the trip to take a little over a week. That way, I would have enough time to see some sights and I wouldn't have to drive after dark. That has always seemed really scary to me. It was day five of my trip and I was ahead of schedule. Utah's border was fast approaching the rocky mountains were in my rearview mirror, and the sun was about to set. It seemed like a good time to stop for the night. I had been lucky enough to find a motel almost every evening so far, and I only had to sleep in my car once up until that point. It wasn't a very good experience, so when I saw a sign for a motel on the highway, I felt relieved. I turned off at the next exit, and followed the signs until I reached the motel. The bright neon sign stood tall in front of the parking lot, the sun almost set behind it. It was a single level building that was wrapped around the parking lot in the shape of an L. I drove my car past the sign and parked in one of the many empty spots. There were three or four other cars there out of maybe 10 or 15 spaces. I walked to the office and rented a room for the night. Then I made my way to the other side of the building where my room was. When I walked in, nothing struck me as odd. It was a decently clean place with a bed and TV. What more could I ask for? One thing that I did notice about the place was how thin the walls were. As soon as I stepped into my room, I could hear my neighbor talking. He must have been talking on the phone though, because I could only hear one voice. It was sufficiently muffled by the walls that I could only make out every five or six words though, so I didn't really know what he was talking about. It was a little annoying, but only a mild inconvenience at this point. I jumped into the shower and brushed my teeth, ready to get some sleep so I could get back on the road early in the morning. When I went to bed, 
My head was pretty much against the wall where I could hear my neighbor. Now, it sounded like there were two people talking, and they seemed to be arguing. They were definitely two men, and although I can't be sure, I think I heard a few words in their muffled conversation that are slang for drugs. The talking continued for some time, and it seemed like the intensity was building. After a while, they were in a full-on shouting match, and I definitely heard some swearing. It was so bad that I almost called the police, but I decided that it was none of my business. Then, something happened that still sends chills down my spine. I heard the loud, thunderous sound of a gunshot, then silence. I jumped out of bed and hit the floor. If the walls were thin enough that I could hear talking through them, then I doubt they would stop a bullet. I lay there for a few minutes and heard nothing. I was pretty sure that it was safe, so I got up and dialed 911. I guess someone else had already called, because I started to hear sirens before I even told the operator where I was. When the police arrived, they asked me some questions. I told them what I could about the conversation that I'd overheard, and then of course I told them about the gunshot. I then found out that the bullet had gone into the ceiling, and nobody was hurt. I guess it was some kind of warning shot. Both guys must have taken off after that, and I never found out what happened to them. I laid awake for the rest of the night. Sleep was out of the question, and I started driving again as soon as the sun came up. It wasn't long before I made it safely to my new home, and although this incident could have been much worse, it does find its way into my thoughts from time to time. A few years ago, my wife and I booked a weekend at a nice-looking bed and breakfast in a small town near where we lived. It was about a four-hour drive from our house through some pretty remote stretches of highway. We had taken Friday off work in order to make the drive. We left at noon and planned to arrive at around four. Then we would have plenty of time to check in and maybe go for a walk around the town. We had been driving for an hour or two and the highway was almost deserted. It was a single lane each way. At one point, I asked my wife to change the music on the stereo, and when she did, she noticed that we did not have any cell service. Not a big deal or anything. We didn't need access to every song in the world, but it is actually important to this story. After another hour or so, we noticed a car pulled over on the shoulder, about three or four hundred feet ahead. We figured it must have been someone having car trouble. I work as a mechanic, so I figured we would stop and see if I could help. If it was a flat tire, or something simple like that, then it would really be easy for me to get this guy going again. As we got closer, I could see that there was a man standing next to the car waving at us. He was about average height, with a beard and a dirty baseball hat. He looked like the kind of guy who would know how to change a tire, but you never know. I stopped my car behind his, and got out while my wife stayed in the car. He walked towards me, and we met halfway up between the two cars. I could see now that there were no flat tires, and the hood was popped. He said his name was James, and he was very polite and friendly at first. I'm sure he was relieved that someone stopped to help, since there was no cell phone service on this stretch of road. We talked for 30 seconds or so. He must have thanked me four or five times for stopping. Then he simply asked me for a ride to the nearest town, so he could call for help. I told him that I was a mechanic, and that I would be happy to take a look. I added that oftentimes, it's something simple that can be easily fixed, and we could save a lot of hassle. At this moment, his friendly smile changed to an annoyed frown. He looked at me stone-faced, then with a flash, he forced the smile back onto his face and said something like, I wouldn't want to put you through that. A ride to town is really all I need. I was spooked by this. It seemed like he just wanted an excuse to get into my car. If my car was broken down, then I would be thrilled to have a mechanic stop at the side of the road, willing to help. We stood there looking at each other for a few seconds. His forced smile was wearing thin, and I said, I'm happy to look at the car, but that's all I can do for you. When I said that, what was left of his smile disappeared. This guy was angry. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was some kind of guilt-tripping rant about how people never help each other anymore. I was impervious to his words, though, and I calmly walked back to my car, where my wife was waiting. 
When I got in, my wife asked what happened. I told her, and we took off. I was a little shaken by this incident, but we didn't let it ruin the trip. However, it doesn't end there. About half an hour later, we were stopped at a gas station, filling up the car, when I looked over at the road. There was a car driving by on the highway while I was filling up. I looked over at the driver and was shocked to see that it was James, the guy from before. We locked eyes for a split second until he disappeared around a corner. It was then that I realized that I'd made the right decision by not giving him a ride. He didn't want me to look at his car because he knew there was nothing wrong with it. I can only guess what he would have done if I'd let him get into my car. My wife didn't notice when he drove by, and I decided not to tell her right away because I thought it might ruin our trip. We ended up having a really great time, and we never ran into James again. However, I worry that he will try this trick on someone else, and they may not be as lucky. I'm an Uber driver, and I've seen some strange things in the four years that I've been doing it. This story, however, is about the scariest night of my life. It's also probably the closest I've ever come to death, and it only happened last month. I was working late at night. My city's under a million in population, so it's far from a bustling metropolis. It's big enough so that there's always something to do, but small enough so that it's not that hard to escape the commotion. It's a relatively short drive before you're in the country, or in the forest. I really like that. I picked up a passenger at around midnight on Saturday night, so Sunday morning I guess. He was a little younger than me, I thought so anyway. I'm 28, and I would say that this guy was 25 max. He was around 5 foot 8, and he was clean shaved with a buzzed head. He was thin, with big bug-like eyes. He got into my car, and barely acknowledged me. That was fine with me, because I don't need to be talking all the time. His destination was in an area that I didn't know very well, and it was outside the city, in a rural part. It would be around a 30 minute drive to get there, and while I was driving, I looked at my passenger in the rearview mirror. He hardly said a word to me so far. I didn't mind the silence, but something about this guy was troubling. I'm used to all kinds of passengers. Drunk people are probably the most common, at this time of night anyway. But this guy wasn't drunk. I would know. You develop a sense for that kind of thing in my line of work. He was absorbed with his phone, and he had a look on his face that worried me. It looked like anger. Almost like a manager who was angry with his workers. I wondered what he was doing, but it was none of my business so I just kept driving. I took a turn onto a country road. The smooth pavement was replaced with rough gravel. I could feel the change immediately. There were no street lights, but the moon was full, so I could see a fair distance ahead. I glanced at the map on my phone and noticed that his final destination was not too far, but there was nothing out there. It was a cornfield to the right and a forest to the left. Hey buddy, are you sure this is right? I asked. We're almost there, he replied, the first full sentence I'd gotten out of him. After a few minutes, I saw a light in the distance. I wasn't sure what it was at first. As it got closer though, I could tell that it was a truck. There was a man in the front seat, I could just barely see him. I stopped in front of the truck, and my passenger jumped out. He shut the door and jumped into the truck. I turned my car around and started heading back. I was really confused though. Why would somebody get an Uber to a truck in the middle of nowhere? Why wouldn't his friend just pick him up? I didn't know why, but I didn't care at the time. I was about half a mile from where I'd let him out when I lost control of my car. It was like all four tires burst at the same time. I swerved left and right, struggling to stay on the road. Eventually, I came to a stop. I sat there in the driver's seat for a few seconds to compose myself, and then I got out to check what happened. Sure enough, all four of my tires were flat. There was no way that that was a coincidence. Something was wrong. Without thinking, I ran into the woods, which was next to the road. I hid behind a tree and waited. After a minute or two, a pair of bright headlights appeared behind my car. It was the truck from before. 
Now there were three men sitting in the truck. One was my passenger, another was the guy who I saw before, and then there was a third. They stopped in front of my car, and when they did, I remembered that I left my phone in my car. I almost cursed out loud, but I stopped myself. By that point, I was pretty sure that I'd fallen into a trap. Those guys must have popped my tires somehow. Maybe the third guy put out a spike strip or something after I passed on my way. The three guys got out of the truck and walked over to my car. The front door was still open. Where is he? One of them said. He can't be far. Another added. After I heard that, I feared for my life. So I pulled my head behind the tree to avoid being seen. The men continued to talk, and I could also hear them going through my car. I was kicking myself for not taking my phone. I was pretty sure there was service on my way in. I wouldn't have been surprised, though, if this was a small dead patch that they had planned. Still, it was a stupid mistake to leave it. After another few minutes, the truck drove away. I was relieved, because I thought they would try to find me. I was able to get a clear look at the truck, and all three men were there. This was my chance, and I started walking through the woods. It would be at least an hour-long walk to get back to the main road this way, but I couldn't take the road and risk being caught. I eventually made it to the road and flagged down a car. I had the driver call 911 for me. The police met me at the side of the road, and I told them what happened. We went to a rest stop to discuss further. One of the officers called for backup, and they went to the spot where it happened. When the officer got back, one of the cops told me that there was nothing there. At first, I thought he went to the wrong place, but then he showed me some pictures that he'd taken of the scene. It was the right spot. The skid marks from my burst tires were there and everything. Those guys stole my car. I never found out why they let me go. It wouldn't have been hard for them to find me. I'm thankful to have survived, and although my tormentors have not been found yet, I still have hope. This happened a few years ago. I used to drive for Uber, but only part-time. I had a good full-time job, but I worked from home, and I had hardly any real-life interaction with other people. I thought it'd be good for me to get out there and get away from my apartment for a few hours once in a while. After this incident, though, I quit and never looked back. I headed out at around 8pm as I usually did. Things were slow, and I only had two passengers in the first hour. One was a group of college-aged girls who seemed to be going to some kind of a party, even though it was a Tuesday night. The other was a single woman, who I think was a waitress, on her way home from work. After that, I sat idle for 10 or 20 minutes. Eventually, I got a ride request. The user had no rating, which itself isn't a huge red flag. Everyone has to take their first ride at some point, but it was unusual. I accepted it, and drove to the pickup spot which would take around 10 minutes. It was actually not that far from my apartment. In fact, I had passed my building on the way. I got to the spot and pulled my car over to the side of the road. There was nobody there, so I sent a message to my passenger, whose name was Telly. That is what it said, anyway. A few seconds after I sent the message, I got a reply. Be right there, it said, albeit with really poor grammar. I sat there waiting for a few minutes, Usually I take off after 10 minutes. I kept my eye on the clock, and after seven and a half minutes, a man approached my car. He introduced himself as Telly and got in. He was probably in his early 20s, with a long beard and wild bushy hair. He was slightly overweight and wore a pair of thin framed glasses. I usually try to start a conversation with my passengers. Some of you may think that's annoying, but I don't care. How's your night going? I asked. Uh, fine, Telly said. The tone in his voice told me that he didn't want to talk, so I backed off and kept driving. Telly had his eyes on his phone for the most part, but he would periodically look out the window in a troubling way, like he was worried about something. Another thing I noticed was that he was nervous. He was shaking and sweating. I think he had even been crying recently, but maybe it was just from the stress. I was starting to feel nervous with him in my back seat. 
so I periodically watched him through the rearview mirror as often as I could. I thought he was on drugs or something. I glanced at him again. His hands were gripping his phone. This time, I noticed that there were traces of blood on his hands and some clear cuts on his knuckles. I also noticed a blood stain on his shirt. I was feeling really creeped out, but the destination was fast approaching, so I figured he would be gone soon. We stopped at the destination, which was just a McDonald's. Telly got out and mumbled thanks on his way. I called it a night after that. I drove home and went to bed. The next day, when I was at my desk working, I heard a loud knock at my door. I stood up and walked there, then looked out the peephole. Two police officers stood in front of my door. My heart sank into my stomach, and my mind raced while I tried to think of what it could be about. I opened the door cautiously and didn't say a word. One of the officers told me that they were searching for a suspect who was wanted for a mugging and brutal beating of an elderly man. As soon as he told me that, I thought of Telly. They then showed me a picture, and it was him. I then told the police everything I knew. I showed them the record on my Uber account, and even gave them my dashcam footage. Telly was caught that day, but I'm not sure what happened to him after that. I tried to find some news articles about the incident, but there weren't any. I stopped driving shortly after this incident. It can be really dangerous out there for drivers, and it's simply not worth it to me anymore. My name is Jane, and I'm in my last year of graduate school, studying pharmacology. I do my best work late at night, so I often spend my evenings studying at the library, usually until it's quite late. At my school, the library is open until midnight most nights of the week. During the last month of each semester, it's open all night, so it wasn't uncommon for me to stay there until 2 or even 3 in the morning sometimes. It was a large modern four-story building with a computer area on the main floor. The other floors were packed with bookshelves and various study areas scattered between. I would always try to find a quiet area where nobody would bother me. I was there late on a Thursday night. To be honest, I wasn't getting very much done. I had my laptop out, and I was really just watching YouTube videos, so I decided to call it a night. By then, it was well past midnight, so I knew the buses wouldn't be running anymore. My place was way too far to walk. It would also be too dangerous to walk alone at this hour. I decided to call an Uber, which I often did when I was there late. I packed up my stuff and walked out the large glass doors at the front of the library. As I stood there waiting, I looked at my phone to keep an eye on the status of my ride. It wasn't long before a red sedan pulled up to me. I got in and said hello to the driver. The driver was a man in his mid-thirties. He had an unkempt beard with thick glasses and a winter hat, even though it was April. I would say that his style was that of a hipster. He said hi back to me. When we started driving, I was playing a game on my phone. The driver tried to talk to me a few times, but I brushed him off and turned back to my game. He clearly wanted to talk, but I just wasn't in the mood. Eventually, he seemed to take the hint, and we just kept going. I didn't get any really creepy vibes at that point. We made it to my place without incident, and he dropped me off in front. I had a first floor apartment in an old house, and it was divided up by floor. I had neighbors above and below, each with a separate entrance. I got out of the car and thanked the driver flippantly, then shut the door and walked into my apartment. I looked back before I closed my door, and the guy was still sitting there. He was directly under a streetlight, and he was looking up at me, but as soon as he saw that I noticed him, he turned away. I closed my door and then went to bed and fell asleep right away. Over the next week, I started to feel like I was being watched while I was at home. Like I said, my place was on the ground floor of a house. My bedroom was at the back, and my window overlooked an alley that didn't get much foot traffic. However, recently, I started to see a dark figure walking by my window frequently. It didn't alarm me at first, but one night, I thought I saw him trying to look in through my window. I always kept the curtains closed, but I could see through a little bit. I walked over to the window, but when I got close, 
the figure disappeared. At this point, I was creeped out, and I thought I was being stalked, but I couldn't prove it. I was worried that if I told anybody, then they would think I was just crazy, so I kept it to myself. Not long after that, I was studying late at the library again. It was around 11.30 when I decided to call it a night. I called an Uber and waited in the front of the building, like usual. I was feeling paranoid this time, so I decided to enter an address that was a block or so away from my actual address. That way, the driver wouldn't know where I live. When my ride pulled up, it was that same red sedan as before. I hadn't remembered the guy until I saw him again. I had used Uber for this trip a few times, and this was the first time that I'd seen the same driver again. When I got into the car, he seemed surprised to see me. Our eyes connected through the rearview mirror, and a chill went down my spine. I don't know why, but he really creeped me out this time. The car started to move though, so I figured I would just take the ride. I was relieved when he dropped me off in front of my place. I crossed the road and opened my front door, then I went to bed. When I was lying in bed trying to sleep, I realized something. I had put in a nearby address as my destination, but the driver dropped me off right in front of my place. Perhaps he had a good memory, but even still, I thought they were supposed to just follow the app. I eventually fell asleep after what felt like an hour or so. I woke up to a banging sound on my window. I sprung up startled by the noise. I scurried to the other side of my room to get away from it. I watched in horror as a dark shadow behind my curtains moved outside my window. The noise continued. It was like somebody was trying to force it open. I spotted my phone laying on my bed, so I ran over and grabbed it, then dialed 911. I ran out to my living room and quietly closed the door to my bedroom, then I moved the couch in front of it. The police arrived in minutes. They managed to catch my would-be attacker in the act. One of the officers met me at the front of my house. He tried to calm me down on the porch. Just then, I saw another officer with a man in handcuffs. It was that creepy driver from before. I bet you didn't see that coming. I thanked the police officers for arriving so quickly, otherwise that guy may have gotten away. I stayed with a friend that night, and for the next few nights. I moved out of that place soon after, and now I have a roommate. I've been driving trucks since my early 20s, and I'm 35 now. At the time of this incident, I was hauling garbage across the border between Canada and the United States. Not my dream job to be honest, but I make over $90,000 a year and I never finished high school, so it's not all bad. I would usually start at 6am, and as soon as I adjusted to the early mornings, I didn't mind the hours. The roads were always really peaceful for the first couple hours of the day. It's nice to have the road to myself for a bit. Also, it's pretty dangerous on the roads, especially when it's busy. I was driving down a road that I didn't normally use. There was a stretch of my normal route that was closed for construction, so I had to take an alternate way. The road I was on was not exactly a highway. It was a single lane each way, and there was forest on both sides. It was just past six in the morning. I had just started the day, and the sun was barely up. It was early April in northern Michigan, and the morning was cold, probably around freezing. My hands were shaking on the wheel because the truck still hadn't warmed up completely. I leaned over to turn up the heat, then I noticed the empty cup holder in the center console. I really wished I picked up a coffee on my way out. When I looked back up at the road, I saw something moving in the woods off to the right. I jerked my head around trying to see it for an extra split second, but it was gone. It looked like a person, but I only got a quick look so I wasn't sure. There were definitely deer in the area, but I hadn't seen many that year. I pulled the truck over to check if it was someone who needed help. The spot was far away from everything, and I didn't see a car pulled over anywhere nearby, so it really could be somebody who needed help. Once I stopped the truck, I opened the driver's side door and stepped out. I walked into the woods and looked around. There was nothing there. I walked in for a minute or two, and then I called out hello, but there was no answer. There was an eerie vibe in the air, 
but I wasn't sure why. I was starting to feel scared, but also curious. I kept walking around. I was almost at the spot where I thought I'd seen the figure before. That was when I saw something on the forest floor. I walked towards it, and when I got there, I realized I was standing over a pile of bloody clothes. I even noticed a piece of duct tape that was attached to one of them. I looked up quickly and scanned the area, but I couldn't see anyone. The forest was sparse and I could see a fair distance in all directions, but the coast was clear. I turned around and ran back to my truck. I jumped in the front seat and locked the door, then I dialed 911. The spot was a fair distance from the nearest town, but the police arrived in less than 10 minutes. We went back to that spot in the woods, but there was nothing there. I was sure that I'd led them back to the right spot, but it was simply empty. I was worried that the officer would think I was lying, but he took it very seriously and called for backup. There was a search in the forest based on my report, but nothing was ever found. It's been almost two years since this happened, and I've been keeping a close eye on the news since. I haven't seen any reports of missing people or bodies found. To this day, I have no idea what happened, but somebody was definitely up to something. This happened last year when I was driving across the country alone to visit family on the East Coast. I lived in Texas at the time. I'm afraid of flying, so I try to avoid it at all costs. I've done this trip a few times and I actually enjoy having the time to myself. The trip would be two solid days of driving, so I would stop at a hotel or motel for a night on the way. I was about two hours into my journey and I already had to go to the bathroom, so I pulled into a rest stop which I had been to many times before. I wasn't that far from home after all. I got out of my car and started walking to the building. When I was almost there, a truck pulled up to me and someone started trying to talk to me. It was a large white transport truck, a full-sized 18-wheeler that looked to have a full load. The truck was still running, so I couldn't tell what he was trying to say. I think he offered me a ride or something, but I don't know why, because pretty much everyone at that rest stop had gotten there by car. I didn't know what to do but I didn't want to be rude, so I just smiled and nodded, and then I simply walked away. I didn't think much of it at the time, so I went in and used the washroom. When I came out, the truck was gone. I walked back to my car and drove away. The incident was far from my thoughts as I continued my ride. I drove another few hours. Eventually, I looked through my rearview mirror, and I noticed a large white truck in the distance behind me. My mind went to that guy from before, but there was no way to know if it was really him. White is a common color for trucks, so it wasn't that troubling. I couldn't help but remember that guy though. I kept an eye on my mirror for the next few hours, and I didn't see that truck again. When the sun began to set, I started to look for a hotel or motel close to the highway. There was a truck stop on the left side of the road with a small motel next door. It was far from luxurious but for the situation, it was perfect. There was even a restaurant which was a welcomed feature because I was really hungry after the full day of driving. I parked in the mostly empty parking lot and went to the office. I rented the cheapest room, then went to the restaurant. When I was done, I walked out and headed to my room, but I noticed something. In the truck section of the parking lot, there was a truck that strongly resembled the one that I'd seen earlier. I walked over to it and looked in the window, but it was empty. After that, I went to my room and locked the door. Then I laid down on the bed and fell asleep almost instantly. It was only around 9.30pm, but I was really tired from the day. The next thing I remember is waking up in the dark room. I could hear a noise from outside my room. It was a kind of metallic grinding type of sound that was coming from my door. I got up and walked towards it and then I peeked through the window. There was someone out there. It was a man, and he was doing something to my door, trying to break in, I assumed. I ran over to my phone and called 911. The man must have heard me talking to the police, because the next time I checked, he was gone. An officer arrived, and when he did, I told him that someone was trying to break into my room. There was a security camera nearby, 
and the police showed me an image of the man. It was the guy from before. When I saw that, I described his truck and told him about the incident from the rest stop. With that information, they were able to track the guy down and arrest him. The creepiest part was that at the time, I thought I was being paranoid, but I was actually being stalked. I'm thankful every day that I woke up when I did, because if he got into my room while I was asleep, it would have been really bad. I recently made a career change, but I used to work as a truck driver. I was on a long haul, driving through the heart of the Midwest. It was getting dark, and it had been a long day. The air was chilly, and the wind whistled through the two-inch space at the top of my window. It was a lonely road, and I hadn't seen another vehicle for a while. However, I eventually noticed a car in my rearview mirror. I didn't care at first, but as I kept driving, the car stayed right behind me. Cars are usually pretty eager to get past me. I had to strictly follow the speed limit, but most cars speed at least a little. It seemed like the car was following me, but I wasn't sure. After around 20 minutes, the car was still there. That's when I noticed a sign for a rest stop. I figured it was time for a break anyway. I thought I might even call it a night, actually. I decided to pull into the stop to see if the car would follow. When I parked my truck, the car parked right next to me. That was extremely strange, because there were separate sections for the trucks and cars. Cars weren't supposed to be there. I got out of my truck and walked around to the front of the car. I could hear its engine idling, and I turned to see the driver staring at me. The car was newish, probably 2005, and it was a Toyota. The color was hard to tell for sure in the dark, but it was some kind of gray or silver. There was a large dent in the right fender. I waved at the driver cautiously, trying to get his attention, but he didn't answer. He just stared straight ahead. I couldn't tell much about the guy except that he was around my age and wore glasses. He also had dark hair and a mustache. Suddenly, the car's engine roared to life and it started to roll towards me. I was still standing in front of it. I jumped out of the way just in time. I turned to look at the car and the brake lights glowed bright. The car was reversing towards me quickly. I managed to hide behind my truck. While I was hidden, I heard the car screech to a halt and then it seemed to speed away. I was left standing in the middle of the truck stop, confused and scared. What had just happened? Why had that car just tried to run me over? I decided to call the police. I told them what I could, but I didn't have much to go on. I wasn't able to remember the license plate, even though I did make an effort to look at it as he drove away. I decided not to stay there that night. I was too nervous that the car would come back and do something to me. It was another few hours before I was able to stop for the night, and by then, it was really late. I was very anxious the next day. Every time I stopped for gas or food, I was on high alert, scanning the area for any sign of that car. That day, I was caught in a traffic jam. On highways like this one, that almost always means that there's an accident up ahead. It wasn't a city during rush hour or anything. When I finally passed the accident, I looked over and saw what I was pretty sure was that car from the other night. It was on the back of a flatbed truck with another car. The accident looked pretty serious. I scanned the area for that creepy guy, but I couldn't see him. I wouldn't be surprised if he was taken to the hospital, or worse. I still don't know what that guy was up to out there. I think he caused that accident that I saw, and I think he did it on purpose, but I may never know why. I had a scary encounter with a stranger a few years ago, and that's what this story is about. I live in a different city than my parents, and I would often make an 8 hour drive at least once or twice a year to visit them. I would do the trip in a single day, starting in the morning or early afternoon. It was late October, I was over halfway there, and the sun was starting to set, casting an orange glow on the landscape. As I drove down the quiet road, 
I saw a transport truck pulled over to the side. Its hazards were flashing. At first, I wasn't sure if anyone was inside, but as I got closer, I saw that the driver's door was slightly open. I pulled over, thinking that maybe someone needed help. I stepped out of my car and walked over to the truck. There was no one inside, but I noticed that there was a wooded area next to the truck. I called out, Hello? Is anyone there? But there was no response. As I turned to walk back to my car, I heard a noise behind me. I turned around and saw a man standing there. He was holding a gun and pointing it right at me. He was a big man, probably only 5 foot 10, but muscular. The man didn't say anything, but he kept his gun trained on me. I slowly backed away from him, my hands up. I was too scared to speak, and I could barely think. I kept backing away until I was at my car. I didn't take my eyes off the man the whole time. I carefully opened my car door and got in. Once I was inside, I locked all the doors and started the engine. I watched the man lower his gun as I started to drive. I looked in my rearview mirror to see the man standing by his truck, watching me. I pulled away from the side of the road and drove as fast as I could towards my family's town. My heart was racing as I tried to process what had happened. I had never been in a situation like that before, and it was truly terrifying. I kept replaying the scene in my mind, trying to make sense of it. As I drove, the seriousness of the situation sunk in. The man could have easily shot me or taken my car, but he hadn't. Maybe he was just as scared as I was. I figured he must have thought that I was trying to rob him. That's the only explanation that I can think of. I thought of it more, and now I wonder if that truck driver had something to hide. Maybe there was something in his truck that he didn't want me to see, or maybe he was doing something in the woods at the side of the road that he didn't want anyone to find out about. These are ideas that I had a long time after the actual incident, so I have no idea what is true. I just don't think he would have pointed a gun at me for nothing. It's just hard to understand. When I finally arrived at my family's town, I felt relieved. I told them what happened. They were shocked and scared for me, but also grateful that I'd made it out okay. We spent the rest of the evening talking and catching up. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. This happened last fall, in around mid-September. I drive trucks for a living, often doing multi-day overnight trips. It was getting late one day, and I was feeling exhausted. I knew I had to stop for the night. I pulled into a rest stop off the highway. It was a small stop with space for only three or four trucks. There was one other truck there, and probably four or five cars in the parking lot. There was a small washroom with a paid shower and there was also a restaurant. I parked my truck and went in for a shower, and I had dinner at the restaurant. After that, I went into the back of my cab and fell asleep. I was suddenly awakened by the sound of my own voice saying, I really need to pee. Not literally, but I did need to pee. I opened my eyes and looked at my watch. It was 3 a.m. I didn't want to get up, but there was no choice. I crawled out of my truck and made my way to the washroom. As I was washing my hands, I heard footsteps approaching. I thought that was strange because I hadn't seen anyone else when I got up. I made my way out and walked back towards my truck. When I got close, I saw a man standing in front of my truck. He was about six feet tall, with dark hair. He was wearing a dirty oversized hoodie and baggy jeans. There was a light to his right, which was casting a large shadow over most of his body. I tried to move past him to get back to my truck, but he blocked my way. He had a mean look in his eyes, and I knew he had bad intentions. Before I could say anything, he pulled out a knife and pointed it at me. Give me your wallet, he demanded. I was scared out of my mind, but I stayed calm. I slowly reached into my pocket and pulled out my wallet, and I handed it to him. He rifled through it, taking all my cash and credit cards. It wasn't much, 
maybe thirty dollars. Is that all you've got? He growled. I told him it was, but he didn't believe me. He searched through my pockets and found my cell phone. Luckily I had left my keys in the truck. Not the best habit, but in this case, it served me well. The man looked at my phone for a minute and then ordered me to unlock it. I hesitated. That phone was my only lifeline. Without that, I would have no way to call for help. I told him that I would unlock it, and then I took a step back and bolted towards my truck. I could hear him chasing after me, but I was faster. I jumped into the cab of my truck and locked all the doors. I saw the man standing outside, still holding the knife. He banged on the window and shouted obscenities at me. I grabbed my cell phone and called the police. I told them what happened and gave them the location of the rest stop. I looked out my window and the man was gone. I wasn't sure how he had gotten to the rest stop though. None of the trucks or cars had moved since the man disappeared, so he couldn't have gotten far. It felt like an eternity before the police arrived, but in reality, it was only a few minutes. I saw the flashing lights, and then a police car pulled up beside me. I spoke to the officers when they arrived. They told me to wait in my truck while they searched the area, and I did what they told me. After around half an hour, the man was caught. I'm still not sure where he was hiding, or where he was running to, and I still don't know how he got to the stop in the first place. Most confusing though, is what was he doing on the highway at 3 in the morning with no truck or car? It was really unusual. I barely slept for the rest of the night. It was already 4am by the time I was done with the police. I tried to relax in my truck for an hour or so, and then the sun came up, and I continued my journey. I never heard anything about what happened to that guy. I was a long way from home, and I couldn't be bothered to follow up on it. I work as a truck driver. It was an afternoon in April. My eyes were scanning the road ahead of me. In my line of work, I've seen my fair share of weird things on the road, but on this day, something felt different. The sun was high in the sky, and the air was thick with humidity. It had been a day or two since I had really talked to anyone, and my loneliness was getting tough to deal with. That's when I saw her, a young woman with long curly hair, her thumb outstretched in a desperate attempt to hitch a ride. She wore blue jeans and a red hooded sweatshirt. She had a small backpack with a single strap over her right shoulder. I slowed down and pulled over to the side of the road. And I rolled down my window. Need a lift? I asked. She nodded and climbed into the cab of my truck, her eyes darting nervously behind her. She seemed nervous. At that time, I thought she must be new to hitchhiking. I'm not an intimidating person by any means, but I was a stranger, so it would be understandable. She seemed agitated and kept glancing out the window as if she was expecting someone to jump out at any moment. As we drove on, I noticed a car behind us. It was a police car, but the lights were off, so I thought it was okay. Just then, I heard a siren and saw the lights flashing. I was being pulled over. I stopped right away. At that moment, I thought I was in trouble for picking up a hitchhiker. It is technically illegal where I live. My truck came to a stop, and I waited for the officer to approach me. But to my surprise, when the officer approached the truck, he demanded that the woman get out. As she stepped out, I saw her hands were shaking and her face was flushed. I watched in confusion as the officer handcuffed her and led her to the squad car. It wasn't until I heard him radioing in a robbery at a nearby rest stop that I realized what had happened. She had robbed a store and was using my truck as her getaway vehicle. The officer put the woman in the back of the police car, and then came to talk to me. He told me that I shouldn't pick up hitchhikers, but simply gave me a warning. No ticket. I was a little shaken by the experience, but it wasn't so bad. The really scary thing happened when I heard about the story on the news. 
It turned out that the woman had shot a man in the robbery. She had the gun in her backpack when she was in my truck. Up until then, it was a good story for parties, but afterwards, I was genuinely creeped out. 